Blessed be the name of the Lord. What is Christian farming and gardening? I believe it's much, much more than just farming while being Christian. I believe it's much more than just, you know, reading the Bible or going to church and at the same time homesteading and gardening or farming. I believe God's advice and commandments should extend and affect the way that we work and we live every moment of our lives. So right now, homesteading is a big part of our lives. So we want to follow God's commandments and his word when it comes to farming. So I want to present to you this biblical Christian vision of farming and many things are not really followed by anybody. Um, I, I want to do this against the backdrop of our little homestead. I'll show you the slides with what we've been doing so far, our modest efforts at farming and gardening. It's been almost a year, exactly a year since we moved here, since God moved us from Vancouver and he brought us here to New Brunswick. It's now towards the end of March. Yeah, it's still cold, uh, snow on the ground and a couple of days ago it was minus 20 Celsius, which is minus 5 Fahrenheit, so it's pretty cold. During the day it's not too bad, but uh, well, either way, the spring is coming and it's going to be back to gardening and we want to keep doing it the Christian, biblical way. I hope you will enjoy this. Last year we moved to New Brunswick. God took us out of Vancouver. We packed into a U-Haul and we drove all across Canada from Vancouver to New Brunswick. Now we had no background in farming, but God told us to come to New Brunswick, homestead and grow organic garlic. We actually bought our house one year before. That's where God led us to. That's what God led us to do. And it made perfect sense because when the virus came, we had a house waiting for us so we could pack up and go and have a house and a farm and a home and a refuge waiting for us to come to. So we arrived in New Brunswick in March, at the end of March 2020. The first thing we did, we planted a cross. Now that's not exactly everything that makes Christian farming and homesteading, but we wanted to do it to honor God because he is very real in our lives and he guided us all the way to buy this place. He actually spoke to me, told me specifically which property to buy. I heard the audible voice of God giving me the name of the street where our house is. And after we looked at different places, we realized God was correct. He knew all along and that was the best property for us. And that's where we live now. God told us where to move, so we want to give him glory and we, we installed this cross in front of our property. But of course that's not all, that's not all that makes Christian farms, uh, farming, homesteading and, and um, gardening. So what exactly is Christian homesteading? What is Christian gardening? The Bible talks quite a lot about farming. Jesus talked a lot about it and the Old Testament is quite specific about certain things that God wants to do. So let me present what Christian gardening, farming, homesteading, biblical farming is. There's a few points I want to make and the first point is the most neglected. Nobody does it. Nobody follows what God says in this area. I know Jewish people have probably tried to follow God, tried to follow this commandment, but Christians rarely have. And the commandment I am talking about is keeping the Sabbath year. Not the Sabbath day, but the Sabbath year. So in Leviticus 25, it says, For six years you shall sow your field, and for six years you shall prune your vineyard, and gather in its fruits. But in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall not sow your field or prune your vineyard. You shall not reap what grows of itself in your harvest, or gather the grapes of your, uh, of your undressed vine. It shall be a year of solemn rest for the land. 
Okay, so basically the land should be cultivated for six years and then in the seventh year it should be left fallow. All of it, completely, no work at all. Not a rotational system, not just one uh, meadow on the side, no. The whole farm stops working. It's like a Sunday, you, you do nothing. You just let it overgrow. No tilling, no sowing, no pruning, no harvesting, not a thing. And who does that? Nobody does it. Yet this is a serious command. There's so many legalists, so many Christian legalists, and they are like, oh yeah, well you celebrate Christmas, or oh, well yeah, you you know you keep the you keep the Sabbath on a Sunday instead of Saturday. And yet, does anybody do the Sabbath year, which is way more important? It's it's a big thing for a year. You keep the Sabbath year for a year. This is a commandment that tells you to do one thing for a year continuously. So if you, when you think about it, when you don't do it for a year, you go into sinning continuously on one thing for the whole year. It's just like one sin usually lasts a short time. You know, like you, let's say you let out a swear word or something, or I don't know. You know, an evil thought crosses your mind, that's a sin for a few seconds, for a minute. But this sin takes 12 months to complete if you don't keep the Sabbath here. If you want to be a legalist, right? Now, people faked following this commandment by coming up with a rotational system. You divide your field into three parts or whatever number of sections and you let one section be fallow for a year and then you move on. Uh, but nobody really does what the Bible says, that the whole farm stops working for 12 months, all of it. Nobody really does it the biblical way. And now what happens when you don't do it? We see the effects, the evil effects of that, and what happens is soil depletion. And it's a serious problem if you if you are interested in farming at all, if you are interested in gardening, you know that soil depletion is a serious problem and people have been trying to fight it through chemical intervention, as they call it, through fertilizers, adding more manure, uh, adding more nitrogen and other things. But there's nothing much you can do about it because the soil gets used for years and gets things get sucked out of it it gives and gives and gives until there is not much or nothing left to give and the only way to restore the soil to 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 bring some fertility to it is to let it rest already in mid 1800s in Europe they noticed that soil depletion was becoming a real problem and that's when people started experimenting with uh, artificial fertilizers, soon to be chemical fertilizers, phosphates, nitrates, and the whole gamut of them. So already back then, in 18, mid-1800s, soil depletion was a problem. So that shows you that nobody was really following God's commandments. Nobody was keeping the Sabbath year in Christian Europe. This is not about legalism, of course. This is about being practical. God's law is for our own good and God wants to keep us healthy. And that's why he wants us to uh, keep the Sabbath and he wants to keep the soil healthy. And that's why he wants us to keep the Sabbath year for the soil. Now, this is a tough decision because there will be no income in the seventh year. There will be no food in the seventh year. Or will there be? Of course there will be. God wouldn't give us a commandment to make us totally miserable. In Leviticus 25.20 it says, If you say, What shall we eat in the seventh year, if we may not sow or gather in our crop? And God said, I will command my blessing on you in the sixth year, so that it will produce a crop sufficient for three years. When you sow in the eighth year, after the Sabbath year, you will be eating some of the old crop. You shall eat the old until the ninth year when the crop arrives. So God takes care of us. And on our part, it takes some trust. 
But that's what our relationship with God is built on, trust. And God loves it when, when we trust him. So we started our farming slash gardening in 2020. And I tell you, in 2027, when the seventh year arrives, I won't be lifting a finger. We won't be working. We're taking the whole year off and the soil is taking the whole year off and we're resting. And I'm looking forward to that. And I'm looking forward to seeing God's faithfulness in providing for us and restoring the earth. Weeds will grow, the right kind of weeds that will put the right elements back into the soil. For example, we've seen vetch grow on our meadow and vetch gives nitrogen to the soil. So when God grows vetch, we didn't plant it, then that soil gets more nitrogen. When he grows some oxide daisies, some other elements go back into the soil. So God has a plan and he arranges, he designed the whole nature to work perfectly. And that's how we have the balanced ecosystem. When we follow God's commandments and we try not to disrupt it too much with chemical intervention. And that will be my next point, the chemical intervention. That's what they call it. You know, spraying, herbicides, pesticides, they call it the chemical intervention. In the book of Revelation, it says that God will destroy those who destroy the earth. The amount of pesticides and herbicides sprayed is mind boggling and Christians should not be part of this destruction of nature. I don't want to talk too much because this is this is a pretty obvious point. God will destroy those who destroy the earth. I think that's enough said. Sadly, Christians don't take it seriously. It's the liberals who try to eat organically, who don't support conventional farming, don't support GMO foods and 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 pesticides and herbicides. But I do need to mention two points shortly. One is that there are more pesticides and herbicides widely used than just Roundup. Roundup is almost a diversion. People focus on the Roundup and we get happy when, it, when it's banned. I get happy when it's banned, like it's banned in Europe. But did you know there is another pesticide or herbicide uh, called atrazine from a Swiss company called Syngenta? And that is almost as widely used and even more harmful, possibly more harmful than, than the Roundup. And it's used in many, many countries since 1958. And it causes all sorts of defects and, and it's a very strong poison. Think about it. When they spray, when they spray fields with pesticides and herbicides, people spraying, they wear gas masks and hazmat suits. It looks like hazmat suits. They look like astronauts. They won't even breathe it in. Why would you want to eat it, right? So we are definitely against any spraying. If you need to use herbicides or pesticides because, I don't know, you have a bad infestation or something, then there are organic natural alternatives uh, like vinegar, pyrethrum made of chrysanthemum uh, flowers and others. So Christians should not be farming with chemicals. Uh, we should be caring for the earth because God cares for his creation and he will destroy those who destroy the earth. So we should be farming organically. Uh, we should be gardening in a natural, eco-sustainable way. And our bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit. So we should care about what we put into them. A lot of diseases would be avoided if we paid more attention to what we eat and what we drink. Another part of this problem is GMO foods, genetically modified foods. And I believe that is forbidden in the Bible, in the book of Deuteronomy 22.9. You shall not sow your vineyard with two kinds of seeds. Now, this is a very difficult command. And I haven't seen a good explanation for that. But what I believe God is trying to give us, the big picture is not mixing the holy and the profane. It's about, for example, not mixing the church and the world. Churches, they mix with, with the world now, and that's why they are getting destroyed. They shouldn't mix with the world. We shouldn't mix ideas, Christian ideas, with the worldly ideas. We shouldn't mix worldly religions into Christianity, you know, coming up with some new age uh, religions. I think that's the big picture. 
I think we should keep the holy and the profane separate. Uh, we should keep God's word separate from the wisdom of the world, which is really foolishness. So I think that's the big idea that God is presenting in this commandment. But it does mention seeds. One reason the Bible is not always easy to understand is that, is that the Bible had to be clear to the people when it was written two, three thousand years ago. And it has to be also clear to us today. So some verses made perfect sense to a person 3,000 years ago, but they don't make much sense to us today. And the opposite is true as well. Let me give you an example. For example, Jesus talked about wineskins bursting when you put new wine into old wineskins. And that is not an easy passage for, for most people. But most likely it made perfect sense to everybody back in the times of Jesus. But to us today, it could be confusing. We don't keep wine in wineskins and we don't know what Jesus meant by that. It's, not, it's just not a vivid, clear picture. But if you lived in the times of Jesus and if you heard that story, you would probably say, oh yeah, that's what happened to my wineskins last week. They burst. You would have a clear picture of what Jesus was talking about in that parable. And conversely, some prophecies didn't make sense to the Hebrews back then, but they make sense to us now. So it's like that with these seeds from Deuteronomy 22. It probably didn't make much sense to the Hebrews that this commandment, uh, they would be wondering why can't we sow with two different types of seeds. But today we have genetic research. Today we have genetic modification. And today we have GMO crops and companies like Monsanto. And God knew this time would come and he gave us that command for the present time so that we don't farm with genetically modified crops. Because genetically modified crops are two different seeds merged into one or even more than two probably. They, you know, they take cells from one plant or even creature and they merge them into a new creation, a GMO crop. And that's dangerous because we don't know what kind of mutations this will cause down the road. And scientists should not be trying to modify nature on a cellular level. This is above any scientist's pay grade. Now, not everything is GMO yet, but for example, pretty much all soybeans, corn is GMO now these days. Now, the last couple of years, they've been experimenting out of the University of Saskatchewan in Canada with GMO apples. And there is, I think, papayas out of Hawaii and things like that. So slowly they're adding this GMO crop list is growing. And we should make sure we use heirloom varieties, clean. If God created an apple, plant an apple buy organic seeds. Do not use some crazy Franken creations from chemical labs uh, made by globalists. Tend to the garden, continue God's creation, tend to, tend to the garden like uh, God told Adam and Eve. Instead of destroying the ecosystem, killing the bees with the GMO products and pesticides and, and destroying the earth. So I believe Christians should not be supporting GMO production, genetically modified foods. The next thing I want to mention is planting fruit trees the biblical way. Leviticus 19.23 When you come into the land and plant any kind of tree for food, so that's fruit trees, tree for food, it's not talking about spruces and, and oaks, um, then you shall regard its fruit as forbidden three years it shall be forbidden to you it must not be eaten so for three years after you plant a tree the first three years you don't touch it you don't pick any fruit and then it says in the fourth year all of the fruit shall be holy an offering of praise to the lord so the fourth year all of it goes to the lord it's an offering it's not a tithe it's, a, it's like a hundred percent offering in the fifth year, you may eat of its fruit to increase, to increase its yield for you. So the yield will increase if you do that. Today, we know that when we plant fruit trees, 
it's very important for them to de develop a strong root system in the first years of growth. So people put manure around and fertilize the trees and that's all good, but God already took care of that. See, God has a plan for nature and you don't have to do much because if you don't touch the fruit on a tree or a bush, this also applies to uh, grapes. And in my research, that should extend to bushes like raspberry bushes or whatever. The fruit falls to the ground around the base of the tree and it becomes food for the tree itself. And the root system benefits because that fruit after it falls, it rots and it becomes a fertilizer. It fertilizes the soil around, around the base of the tree and then the root system develops strong and the tree is healthy and in the future, it will increase its yield. So that's the biblical way of planting fruit trees. How do we offer the fruit holy to the Lord, the fruit from the fourth year, on a practical level, how do, we, how do we offer that fruit to the Lord? How do we make it holy? And there's no temple today, of course, so we cannot, bring it to, we cannot bring it to the temple, but I believe we just bring it to a soup kitchen connected to a church or a Christian, Christian charity, some kind of a food bank so that the poor may have food to eat because that was the purpose of bringing food to God's storehouse so that there's always food for those who don't have enough. And the last point, last but not least, is tithing. And of course, Christians should tithe, farm or, farming or not, but when you tithe from your garden, it's, it's special because it's so biblical. It's so, it's so organic, so to speak. Deuteronomy 14.22, you shall tithe all the yield of your seed that comes from the field year by year. So, you know, you read that in the Bible and if you tithe of your paycheck, then the tithing may seem a little disconnected. It doesn't come from your crops. It comes from your, from your salary and it doesn't exactly go to God's storehouse, but you know, it probably goes to a church to pay for the, the, the salary of the staff and maybe maybe the money is used for painting of the sanctuary or something like that. So it's just not exactly like what the Bible is talking about. But in the Bible, in Malachi 3.10, it says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. You dig up your potatoes, you set aside the tenth of those potatoes, the best ones go to the Lord. You take them again to a Christian food bank or a soup kitchen or someplace. And, uh, and, and then the poor people can eat. Those who cannot afford food, they can eat. But that's not the only reason that tithing in farming is so special. When you tithe from your garden, the tithing is your herbicide. The tithing is your pesticide and the tithing is your fertilizer. God says, if you tithe, I will rebuke the devourer for you. The devourer. You know that when you garden, there are so many creatures from the invisible, from little aphids, from the worms and fungi and molds and deer and rabbits and raccoons and whatnot. Everything tries to eat what we work so hard for. Right? There's always something in nature that wants to devour the fruits of your labor, literally. So the devourer are the animals, pests or diseases, but it is also Satan. At the top of that evil chain is Satan. He wants to destroy everything that we do and he wants to destroy us. So he sends the evil deer to eat and destroy our gardens. Yes, the deer are evil. <laughs> the view of deer changes dramatically when you start farming and gardening. They are no longer these cute creatures you see in city parks. No, this time they come at 3 a.m. when you sleep and you wake up and your, your lettuce is gone. And not even gone, it's not even to feed them. They, they seem to just dam do a lot of damage. They, they nibble a little bit, just a little, the, the, the bits that cause the plants to grow. They, they eat young shoots of trees. 
so your tree is stunted in its growth it's awful what deer do yet god promises i will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil so that is the pesticide that is the herbicide and that is the deer fence <laughs> but also and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear that's the fertilizer she sometimes things just don't grow but god promises I will make sure everything grows nicely and it's not eaten when you tithe. Last year when we planted our uh, cucumbers, they grew very nicely. We ate them, they were very tasty and we pickled them. And our neighbors came over and said, how are your uh, cucumbers? Because ours are eaten. There was some kind of a worm and it was just eat the cucumbers in, in when they were very very small i think barely out of uh, you know the germination and and they just the, our neighbors had no cucumbers but we had very beautiful cucumbers and we didn't spray we didn't actually spray anything pretty much we, we just used a little bit of vinegar and pyrethrum other than that we didn't spray and i credit god for that and some of our uh, cabbage didn't grow the best but it would have been probably even worse if it wasn't for God. Because with no pesticides, no herbicides, and lots of deer in the surrounding woods, it's not easy to grow. So as a farmer, you have to rely on God. He will rebuke the devourer and he will cause your plants to grow. In addition to all these commandments, there is one overreaching kind of an umbrella commandment. In Leviticus 26, it says, if you walk in my statutes and observe my commandments and do them, then I will give you your rains in their season and the land shall yield its increase and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. So this is very general, but it's also very much for farming, right? It's, it talks about rains. We know how important rains are and the land with the increase and the trees of the field and so forth. And uh, the statutes and commandments, of course, that covers everything. Um, loving God, loving your neighbor and all the, all the commandments of God. But since this is, it talks about farming, uh, it definitely includes keeping the Sabbath year because how can the land give you good increase if the land is sick, exhausted? It needs its rest. And also, you know, we need to plant the trees the right way. And actually, the language here is very similar. It talks about the increase of the yields in Leviticus 26, as it does in the commandments about the trees. So this is geared towards gardening and farming. So these are the foundations of Christian farming, biblical gardening, biblical Christian homesteading, keeping the Sabbath here, planting trees the right way, tithing of your crops, not polluting the land, and not using genetically modified seeds. I hope this was a blessing to you. I pray that God richly blesses your gardening, your farming, your homesteading. May he protect you from the devourer so that your crops grow and never fail to bear wonderful fruit. Consider tithing for protection of your crops consider the Sabbath year so that the land rests and in the end you will rest and your land will produce better harvest. You will get better yields and God will be pleased. Thank you for listening. May the Lord richly bless you from Zion. Take care. Bye-bye.